everybody, and welcome to the uh, opening plenary of this um, Reno Research Institute uh, Conference on Dialysis. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today uh, moderating the session. My name is Roberto Pequa Filho. I'm a nephrologist and a senior research scientist at Arbor Research Collaborative for Health in, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome our panelists for today. And I'll briefly introduce them before we start the discussion. First of all, we have um, Dr. Fred Finkelstein, who is a clinical professor of medicine um, at Yale University in the USA. Welcome, Fred. Um, we also have uh, joining us from Australia in Perth, uh, Dr. Aaron Chakira. He's a consultant nephrologist at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. And uh, from Canada, uh, Dr. Matthew uh, Oliver. Uh, he's an uh, associate professor at the University of Toronto in Canada. Welcome, Aaron and Matthew. We also have uh, now from the south of the USA, uh, from Nashville, Dr. Tom Goper. He's a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. And uh, from Georgia, uh, uh, our nursing representative in this discussion, Angela Taylor Smith, who's responsible for home therapy in the American <laughs> uh, Nephrology Nursing Association at Fresenius Medical Care. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. All right, so we, we do have about 40 minutes for this discussion and we will be focusing on global trends on peritoneal dialysis. So I think to, to have all the, you know, the background, backgrounds that I described and uh, also the geographies that they uh, represent, it's gonna be a great opportunity to get a, uh, an interesting discussion on, on this issue. Why don't we start by discussing about um, our expectations in terms of growth of PD in the different regions. And um, maybe I'll get started with you, Tom. Um, especially in the US, I think uh, that there has been an interesting movements that might um, move the needle in this, uh, in this area of uh, PD utilization. So what is your expectation in terms of growth in PD uh, utilization in the US? Well, I, you're alluding to uh, the summer of 2019, so pre-pandemic, when uh, President Trump uh, initiated what we, he called the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. And they set up some uh, goals, very aspirational goals, of trying to have 80% of uh, incoming patients on some form of home dialysis um, uh, uh, by I think 2025, I'm not sure the year, it was so aspirational. Yeah. Our program has about 40 uh, patients of our, of our prevalent patients, maybe 35 to 40% of our prevalent patients on home dialysis. So we've been kind of that model, but as you'll hear from the other uh, uh, panelists, they, these are really tough goals to achieve. Uh, I think we're gonna discuss over the course of the, uh, a few minutes we have left, uh, the, the different strategies to get there. Uh, it, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but there, what I'm pointing out is that there was a, a national initiative in the United States to increase home dialysis. Uh, and, and so all the dialysis organizations and the professional societies have taken this to heart. So there are a variety of initiatives that are uh, beginning. Yeah. So I guess if we move to, you know, just across the border to Canada, Matt, uh, I mean, Canada has um, for a while um, um, incentivized the use of PD and the numbers that you have in Canada today perhaps are close to what uh, the aspiration is for the U.S. Um, do you see additional growth uh, possible in, in Canada at the moment? Um, thanks, Roberto. I think we've been trying to promote uh, PD, at least in Ontario, for at least 10 years. Uh, we have a, an agency, which is a government agency, which overse oversees renal specifically for the government. And so there's a lot of measurement, you know, a lot of collaboration. And so the rate of PD has, is about 20 to 25 percent. 
what's been observed over that period of time is, is a reduction in variance. So low performers have been brought up um, and that has helped grow PD in terms of the average at the provincial level. But then once you get into that sort of 20 to 25% range, it has been challenging to move above it. Um, the government would like us to, you know, they, they, they sort of pushed an, an increase of one or 2% over time, small growth, not, not aggressive growth. So always getting better. And there's a whole series of initiatives which have been rolled out. Um, but once you sort of hit that one point, at least on average, it is difficult to go beyond that. So, we're, but we're constantly focusing on improving the quality of PD. And I think that's one of the themes that has to be brought out. It's like not just looking at numbers, but looking at quality and preventing complications, which then hopefully lead to growth. So I think all of these things, if, if they spur quality and make us better, I, th I think that's a very positive thing. Right, yeah. So in Australia, Aaron, what are the numbers nowadays for PD utilization? Perhaps you can put it into like a more home, home dialysis perspective, because I know that in Australia, there is also quite a lot of home hemo. Uh, what are the numbers today? And uh, are, is the healthcare system uh, happy with that or additional uh, efforts are being made to further increase the, the penetration of PD in, in Australia? Thanks, uh, Roberta. So our, our experience has been, I think, fairly similar to the Canadian experience. So we have the sort of tyrannies of geography which make home therapy appealing for a lot of our patients because of the distances that they may be from major renal centres and being able to access satellite care. But despite that, we've probably really struggled to get our home numbers beyond the sort of 20 25%. Percent um, and we have still those same issues with variation between units. So if we look at, you know, my state that, that we're in, we have three major tertiary renal services. Uh, we have about 240 PD patients that we look at in a, in a statewide system, 120 or so managed by our hospital. Fairly similar populations, but one of our hospitals has about half the number of, of PD patients um, compared to us. And so a lot of that is still around centre variation and, and I guess clinician engagement in PD and how much we promote PD as a, as a particular service. Um, we've also been very much like Matthew, trying to find quality measures and trying to find those groups that we can use to raise our PD percentage. And we are still very much focused on trying to bring up the home therapy numbers. Um, some of that's been financial incentives that the Australian government has introduced. Um, so there is a specific home therapies supervision payment that's been available for the last few years. And we certainly saw a change in the trajectory um, since that was introduced. We still don't perform as well as our New Zealand neighbours in terms of getting people onto peritoneal dialysis. Um, and so there's some interesting differences again in, in terms of the way that we present our therapies. Um, and when we're looking at where we're trying to grow our service, I guess, as I said, the, the low hanging fruit for us is probably already gone um, to get to our sort of 20, 20, 25% numbers. And we're now focusing on the areas where we think there is the greatest gain. So when we look from our registry data, and I can talk about that a little bit more in, in detail if you like, you know, the major reasons for our patients coming off PD are transplantation, which is good. We're happy, happy to support that one. Um, social reasons and being unable to self-care and then complications and in particular peritonitis. So our unit specifically has developed over the last five or six years, particular interests in assisted uh, PD models to try and grow that group where self-care has become an issue and try to do a lot of work on peritonitis now as the other, I guess, modifiable factor that we think we can intervene on. Um, at the same time that our PD numbers have stayed static, we have an interesting model in Western Australia where we've corporatized our home therapies to a provider. Uh, and we've actually, with that model and some incentivization for them, we've actually grown our home hemo population. So in the last 10 years, we've actually gone up probably about fivefold from about 10 to 15 home hemo patients to, in fact, over that, we're now sitting at about 100 um, home hemodialysis patients across our state. Uh, and that's again become largely from clinicians taking that on board as something that they're promoting very strongly and a home therapies provider that is built in transitional cares into satellite units to try and bring people into independence. Yeah, interesting. So Fred, maybe, maybe you could wear your hat of, uh, you know, maybe the, 
the most global nephrologist that we have in the session today. <laughs> um, uh, at least uh, th that happened when you, you when we were able to travel, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, maybe maybe I would um, ask you to provide you know maybe some additional uh, interesting examples in terms of growth. I know that you know there there are uh, countries with very interesting initiatives uh, to promote PD growth, and maybe you could describe a few of those that come to your mind. Well, for example, if you look at the USRDS database, and every year they give the percentages of patients on home therapies from various countries around the world, then those numbers vary tremendously. From Hong Kong, where 75 or 80 percent of patients are maintained on PD, to other countries where providing PD is difficult, where the numbers are down around one or two percent. The lesson from Hong Kong or a country like Thailand, which has a PD first program, um, which means that the government will reimburse the care for patients with end stage kidney disease if they go on perineal dialysis, if they go on home hemo, it's their own expense. But in those models, you can train 80, 85% of new starts can be trained on PD. And in Hong Kong for the last 10 years now, 75% of patients have been maintained on PD. Um, Again, if you look at European countries, the numbers can be up to 25 or perhaps 30% in countries like the UK, Netherlands, um, for example. But in other countries like Germany, they're, they're much lower than that, in part because of financial disincentives, in part because of educational programs or um, perhaps industry support. So that was very, I mean, I think we need to take a look at it and think about it in the terms of models of patient choice where patients are given free decisions about what type of therapy they would like, what should those numbers come out like? And I think the lessons from Canada and from Australia then are actually very interesting. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, what's the point in pushing home therapy? Are outcomes better for patients? Is that really what patients want? Or are we doing it because of financial incentives? And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, no, oh, exactly. I, I think this is, uh, Matt already described, you know, this, uh, you know, this, challenges that you start to get when the when the when the percentage of patients on home therapies reach that 30% and um, uh, and, and you know what the what the main issues and, and challenges are in different regions and I think this is a great transition to the second point that I wanted to bring to the discussion here and that is exactly the you know uh, how you know, how do you guys see the main challenges now? And I'll start with you, Angela, uh, to provide the, your, your perspective uh, of the, the main challenges that you'd see for PD growth in the, in, in the U.S. What, what is your, what, what do you think are the main, main challenges that we'll see when numbers start to grow in the, in the U.S.? Uh, one of the challenges I have seen in patients is the fear or the um, misunderstanding or the myth that they have about peritoneal dialysis. Um, some of those fears come from having other family members that were on home um, peritoneal dialysis. And so that have discouraged um, patients not wanting to do um, PD. I have also have seen outside influences as involved in um, discouraging patients from doing um, home dialysis. Um, for example, um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we did have an influx of patients that were interested in doing home dialysis. We had um, a few patients that were lined up to be on home dialysis, but they were outside sources such as physicians that discouraged them from doing um, home dialysis. Um, some other barriers we find is that, um, well, what I would say is what I, the incentives I have seen so far in home dialysis is the standalone home dialysis facilities. Um, the growth has increased in those standalone home dialysis facilities as far as a smaller facility like myself. The numbers, um, I would say in PD, the highest it may have over the years that I have been doing peritoneal dialysis, the highest I have seen in my program is roughly around 20 to 30 patients. But in the home, that standalone home dialysis facility, you may have 80, 60 or 80 patients in those facilities. And now that we are introducing more of the, um, more incentives on multiple training, 
um, for our patients as well as taking care of our existing patients that have also helped increase the numbers of um, patients on peritoneal dialysis. Tom, I see that you're nodding here and uh, it seems to be agreeing with the, you know, what has been described as some of this, you know, challenges. Um, what do you think about this? Well, uh, uh, Angela brings up the point of, which to me translates into uh, education. And, and there's three parties that need education, the physicians, the nurses, and the patients. And uh, uh, she mentioned uh, units where they have a high uh, uh, prevalence of home dialysis. That's because they're champions there. And those champions come from education. And so uh, uh, I'm involved with several initiatives on education. Uh, I, I think nephrology leadership has been slightly remiss with regards to education, home dialysis uh, for trainees in the United States. Uh, and I'm be anxious to hear our Canadian and Australian experiences with that. But in the United States, the uh, home dialysis is the, uh, oh, that extra, if you have time, if you can break away from the hospital, you go see that. And uh, that doesn't work in our program. We, like I said we earlier, we have 35, 40% in home dialysis in, in our entire program. And still to get the fellows uh, over into the home unit is a challenge. And, and so I'm working on several national initiatives, but to what Angela said, I think uh, education of, of, of those three entities, meaning one, the docs, two, the nurses, and three, the patients, that's, that's where we need to uh, put our efforts. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys allow me, sometimes I'll bring the, you know, Latin America perspective to this. And um, we've, we've assessed this, um, the physician training for uh, home therapies and PD in specific in the uh, nephrology uh, training centers in Brazil a few years ago. And we realized that only 50% of the sites with open open spot for fellows and, and residents, only 50% of those sites practice PD at the site level. So really it's, it's complicated when, when a lot of the you know, um, training sites are not exposed to PD, do not, do not practice PD that you would uh, really accomplish uh, the capillarity that you need in terms of training to you know, physicians coming into the, uh, to the uh, practice. Matt, any any, any um, Canadian experience that might be worth mentioning in terms of training? I, I think um, the really important point. So what I've observed is even though we in, operate in an environment where every nephrologist is trained on home dialysis, it's still a, there's a, still a huge pack impact of the local champion, um, both from nursing and from physicians. So we had an experience where we've been trying to grow PD for 10 years, but we hired a a home dialysis specific physician recently over the last two years, and we got further growth through that. So I think one of the things that programs have to think about is who is that champion? Do you have a champion? And if you don't have one, you need one. Uh, so, you know, whether you recruit, you hire, you train. And the thing that was interesting in Ontario is that person was therefore accountable to government. So when they got, as we check, you know, we, we have to sort of check in quarterly with our agency and they want that person to speak to what is happening with PD on the ground? What are you doing to grow it? What are you doing with complications? So you can see it's more sort of a formalized structure. And I think, I think that's helped a, a great deal in terms of growing. The other point I wanted to make out in terms of expertise is just that if you look at all of the reasons why people are lost off of PD, um, it's a huge variety of causes. And, they, and some of them are kind of rare. And so if you don't have that volume that Angela was talking about, that 80, 90, 100 persons in your program, it's hard for that physician or nurse to get expert at managing that one thing that may happen every two, three years. And I think that's part of the issue um, is that they, did, they just, they see that complication, let's say it's a pleural effusion. And the answer is, you know, always stop PD, go to hemo, as opposed to an experience program that might be able to manage to do that at least for some patients and keep them on PD. Yeah. Fred, uh, I mean, one aspect of, of it's not, it's not about training, but it's a, about education, right? Is the, is in the, in, at the moment of transition. So I guess, I guess when we talk about educating people for the, you know, homodality 
is not only about being trained to um, um, train patients and perform well clinically, but also when it comes to uh, ed educating patients in the pre-dialysis phase uh, uh, to choose the modality, right? Yeah, so that's critically important. And that area um, has, that, has actually gotten a lot of attention over the past several years. And the studies that look at this generally find that many patients pre-dialysis have not received ad adequate education. Um, they've not been informed about the choices as adequately as they should be, in part because many patients, at least in the United States with advanced CKD, don't seek care from nephrologists. But even those who have care from nephrologists have not, often not been provided with adequate education. I think one of the problems, at least in the United States, is that there's no funding or support provided for advanced chronic kidney disease clinics where you can have a multidisciplinary approach with nurses, dietitians, social workers participating. I think they have that model in Canada, they have it in the UK. I think they have it in Australia, though I'm not sure. Maybe Aaron can comment on that. But what's clear is the education needs to be multidisciplinary, not simply the nephrologist, it has to be social work, dietary, nursing input, providing education to patients. And yeah. that is absolutely critically important. Yeah. Aaron, do you, do you wanna add something uh, about the Australian experience in, in pre-dialysis education? Yeah, so I couldn't agree more. So uh, central to our model, uh, we run a dedicated low clearance clinic exactly as described. It attended by us, by our trainees, uh, by our specialist uh, nurse educator, by our access coordinator, also by the diabetes nurses, um, and we are lucky that we have a specific activity-based funding model that actually gives an incentive for running an MDT-based clinic. So again, it allows us to bring all those parties together and that particularly the nurse uh, specialist in terms of education and access drives that program. Um, and so we've that, that's certainly been central to our ability to get our PD numbers to where they are. Um, and they've also been very helpful in, in ensuring that our patients try not to I guess, touch the in-centre system if we can avoid it. So we have an issue still that we've not been able to get an acute PD access up um, in our hospital for a, a number of logistical reasons, but we manage to get around that by utilising a lot of buried PD tubes so that these patients come in, they start to get symptoms, they've had a tube in for a period of time, it's exteriorised, same day they've gone home, they've started, um, started PD and they don't end up in the ED, they don't end up on our incentive unit, they don't end up with lines and they've been a, that sort of PD supported from the get-go and that's been really important for us. Um, as well as incentives, just while I'm touching on it, we've also in Australia tried to get rid of some of the disincentives for home therapies uh, and that's involved the state subsidising some of the water and electricity bills around patients who are doing home-based therapies and that's also been very important from a, a national level about driving PD and home hemo. Yeah, I guess one, one thing we, we didn't touch uh, so far is also a, 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 an, a, an, a, another very important um, challenge in PD, which has been the, you know, the high rates of technique failure that we see and, um, and the big problem of peritonitis in that context. Maybe I'll start with you, Angela. Um, do, do you, what do you see as, as important measures from a nursing perspective to prevent and, and, and manage uh, peritonitis, just to try to decrease the you know, tech, technique failure involved in that? Okay. Well, my facility for four years, we had zero peritonitis. Um, recently, um, for these past two years, we may have one case of peritonitis. Um, last year, um, probably there's a hole in the PD catheter, um, recently, I just had um, two patients for um, patient's contamination or um, secondary will be um, constipation. Um, but education is very important in training patients on um, to preventing peritonitis. That's something that I, um, well, how my patient would say it, they can hear my voice <laughs> um, if they think they got to do something wrong. Um, but... In the training process, you have to be very strict on your training. You cannot give any lead ways and say, oh, well, this is okay. The patient needs to establish a routine. 
Um, also on those clinic visits, when the patient comes in, you need to be discussing prevention of um, peritonitis. Um, also, um, I always tell the nurses when they're looking at the exit site, also they need to look at the, the connection because that connection is, becomes loose. If you're just looking at the exit site and don't look at the catheter to totally, then you may have problems where the catheter comes apart. Um, and in the past years ago, those were the problems I had saw in my earliest stage in, in doing peritoneal dialysis. So those are things I'm checking, making sure that they're doing proper exercise care, making sure that they're take, checking their connections to their catheter, making sure that they are not causing other issues such as getting a hole in the catheter, using scissors to take off tape. And the good thing about now that we kind of limited the use of tape, <laughs> um, they have the adhesive dressing so they don't have to worry about trying to cut off tape anymore. Um, but it's just more of an extensive training and just pushing prevention, 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 wearing the mask, hand washing. Um, and it's just a over ongoing routine. So that was some of the things I have done to prevent patients from having peritonitis. Yeah. Any, any experience from your center, Tom, that you, you might bring up? Well, per peritonitis is a, uh, we have a very low rate, which is part of that is luck. Let's just be clear. Uh, I think uh, Angela made good points. And one thing I'm gonna wanna hear from Aaron with regards to registry uh, is because I'm gonna quote something that we know from the United States. When this was looked at in the United States, one third uh, of the patients had 100% of the peritonitis. Now let's flip that. That means two thirds had none, okay? I'd be anxious to hear how that shakes out uh, uh, because Aaron's involved with the registry there. Uh, so peritonitis is, is training, retraining, retraining, and retraining. And every time an event occurs, there's a retraining. We, we examine every episode of peritonitis and try to find a cause. Nonetheless, we, we have a low rate. Uh, the, the issue on techniques of uh, survival really depends uh, as we, as this group has discussed in our preparations, uh, has to do a lot with patient choice, imposed therapy uh, and continuing of therapy. Because while Aaron said losing patients to transplant, that's exactly what our goal is. But, but we, ha we have expanded our therapy into even palliative. Uh, and so you're going to lower your, your threshold or raise your threshold, I guess that's the right expression, raise the threshold of taking somebody off the therapy when they're on this therapy for a very specific reason. And so that does deal with technique survival, which was your issue. You, you morphed it into peritonitis. And, and so I just wanted to expand on that. But I would be very anxious to hear if the Australians have a figure like that American figure where one third of the patients have 100% of the peritonitis. To you, Aaron. Uh, thank you very much. So probably not quite to that extreme, but I think that's been pretty well recognised. And, you know, Simon Davis, when he was publishing some of the original PD work back in the sort of 80s and 90s, showed exactly that. There were patients that were getting recurrent peritonitis. Um, and it was not always entirely clear why that was the case and how much may have been touch contamination, how much was enteric sourced. Um, but you're absolutely right. There are people who do better on PD um, from a peritonitis perspective than others who have completely never get peritonitis. Um, and we don't, I guess, fully know the answers. That PDOPS has been looking at some of this uh, and has been trying to tease out some of these factors. And there seems to be a strong centre effect in terms of peritonitis levels, which suggests that there is there are things that we do uh, that are different that do influence peritonitis. Um, slightly, I guess, off um, topic about general, but, you know, we've shown some quite interesting data in our lab that if you take peritonitis organisms, if you take a staph, a coagulase negative staph from patients from peritonitis um, versus uh, a standard coagulase negative staph, the ones that are growing from these patients are preferentially able to grow in PD fluid, elicit different responses in mesothelial cells. So there's actually seems to be a, a bacterial selection in some people uh, as well as probably a host susceptibility and some of the genetic susceptibility, for example, to spontaneous bacteri bacterial peritonitis in our liver patients um, uh, is also well described. So I think there's a lot of undiscovered country here to 
do exactly that, better identify who, who we should be putting on PD and who we may, need to take better kind of prophylactic measures on it, and we don't know all the answers yet. Yeah, that's great. I, can I add one thing, Roberto? I think it's important yeah. to emphasize that the ISPD has published detailed guidelines on how to reduce peritonitis rates. And when that's been looked at in the PD-DOP studies, many centers actually don't follow those guidelines, and many patients don't follow those guidelines. So having a program which really make sure that those guidelines are followed at all centers as well as with all patients is critically important. And I can't emphasize how important that is. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting, Fred. Well, guys, we have, a, we have about 15 minutes left in our discussion. I, and I really wanted to, um, to uh, bring, bring uh, up front in this discussion some initiatives that you guys consider very important that are going on currently. Um, and um, I guess, I guess, in terms of initiative, Matt, I I wanted to bring bring your experience in, in, to a, a specific things that perhaps we didn't allude that much in the in the earlier part of our conversation, and that has been the impact of the financial incentives in PD growth, and and how do you see this first as a as an important point. Obviously, you know, there, there are many examples that if you, if you don't have balance in terms of reimbursement, there will be low, lower chances of growth, of course. But, I mean, is, is the financial incentive the, the answer to all? Or do you see, using the Canadian experience, that, uh, you know, finances might not, might not be actually the most important issue to, to really promote a, a growth in home therapies? Uh, that's, that's a challenging question. Uh, thanks, Roberto. But... I mean, the, I think it's, it's, the programs have to have some financial incentives to grow PD. I don't think, it, at least in Canada, that's not really the reason we're trying to grow PD. Um, the, the, because basically we pay uh, the programs what it costs to deliver the therapy. Although PD is a little bit more efficient in terms of the nursing ratios and things. So if you look at sort of the, the, the net revenue generation, it, the programs would have more net revenue generation from PD. But that's really not what's driving it. Um, you have to be careful about, like I, I bring this up, but you have to be careful about financial conflicts of interest. So if you put very strong financial incentives on programs, administrators, physicians and nurses, et cetera, then that, that changes the way that PD is, is, is offered to patients and told to patients. So, so I feel strongly there needs to be protections in place for you know, patients not you know, moving. You know, we don't want patients not to be offered PD, which may be going on in the United States a bit, to switch to the other end of the spectrum where they're not offered in center. Um, and, that's, and that can happen. So that's my concern with financial incentives. What I prefer to work on is to, is to put the money not towards the program at large, but to put the, the funds towards initiatives that incentivize patients for PD. So a perfect example of that is assisted PD. In Ontario, we have a, a mature assisted PD model. It's fully funded. We spend approximately $10 million a year on assisted PD. And that is an incentive for patients and families to choose PD. We're not forcing anyone, but that's where I think the funds need to go. Or for example, you know, funding surgeons to take an interest in PD or funding you know, a per an urgent PD program or a coordinator. That's where I think the funds should go. It shouldn't just go to the programs at large sort of generally because there's a chance that they're gonna use that just to, uh, the, the quickest thing to do is to push patient choice and just get a lot of people on PD. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's sort of my view of the- Well, you did, and, and that's a nice segue to what I was gonna ask Tom. I mean, you, you know where this is going, right, Tom? I was gonna I, ask I, you- I, I do, but, but Matt isn't off the hook. I have a question for him first. Sure. So okay. Matt, does, do the funds come to the uh, center, the, the renal center, and then your folks distribute them as you see fit? That yeah, that so works? I'll just give you the assisted PD as an example. So originally when assisted PD was started, the funds went directly to the home care agencies. Then, they sw then the model expanded so the programs could take the money and then pay the fund home care agencies. So there's sort of more command and control. And now the third model is the programs receive the assisted money and they deliver the assisted PD. So, you know, it's, it kind of changes around. But um, the sort of the point is, not to just create a blanket incentive for programs in general, because then they can just find that essentially the most cost-effective way to grow PD, which could be the restriction of choice, but to direct money towards things that support patients, improve quality. That's where I think the funding needs to go. Yeah. So, yeah. Tom, uh, Tom, I, I want to 
I wanted to, you know, transition to your interpretation of how this this is going to be um, in the in the coming years uh, yeah. in we're, relation we're, to the kidney kidney health initiative. That's exactly it. And we were, the kidney health initiative had uh, two models. They they called them uh, end stage treatment choice models. But what that meant was, <laughs> that wasn't referring to the choice uh, for the patients, that was referring to uh, the doctors and their doctor groups making a decision about what kind of incentive and disincentive models they wanted. Uh, so there were, were two models set up. Uh, one was uh, towards the facility, uh, as, as Matt was talking about with a, essentially a, a global capitation to cover the care. And the other one was uh, directed towards uh, 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 incentives just to put more patients on. I, I'm working with Fresenius, which is one of the large uh, large dialysis organizations in the United States, to help with the latter, with the latter model. Uh, and th th it doesn't matter which model was chosen. The, the, in the U.S., through the dialysis organizations, there will be experimentation on incentives and disincentive strategies. I, I kind of will leave it there because we don't know the results. The program I'm involved in, uh, it, it's, so, it's so rudimentary. We, we're working with basic education of the physicians to increase the take on rate. That's how, uh, that's how rudimentary it is. And I do think that over the next three years, we will actually see some experimentation of financial models. But I wanted to clarify the model that Matt was talking about because that's one of the models we're going to be looking at in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Fred, any, any additional comments from um, uh, K.A.? Yeah, I would like, I, I think Matt's point is very well taken, that we need to be careful that patient choice is not being driven by finances, that there's not being financial incentives given to facilities to put people at home, even if it goes against the patient choice. I think the model in Ontario was really the correct model and the model in Australia as well, where funding is provided for things that can help patients manage at home better and provide education to patients. So funding of low clearance clinics, funding for assisted PD, things that do not happen in the United States currently are really critically important. And that's where the money should be given. Given this financial incentives to physicians or facilities to send people home, I think it's the wrong thing to do. Just philosophically, I think it's wrong. But providing support so patients' care can be optimized and patients can make informed decisions with appropriate support systems at home is where our attention really should be focused. Mm. Angela, what do you think about this? Sorry. <laughs> I agree in um, patient's choice um, in growing the PD program. Um, sometimes it, it feels like, um, I know we want that push for a patient to come to home dialysis, but sometimes it just feels like you have that picket sign up, recruiting patients to come to peritone, um, do, do peritoneal dialysis or home dialysis. So, but I think education is very, very important. I like the incentives of the transitional care units where the patients get a visual um, experience of what PD is or what home hemodialysis is. I think that is very important because handing out flyers or just giving or talking about it does not give them an overall um, experience of what home dialysis is, but that visual or being like some units are setting up the home dialysis machine in the in-center hemodialysis facility where patients can um, dialyze on the home hemodialysis machine. And so, and then other patients can see that as well. Um, they also have where um, ki um, kidney care advocates or patient advocates that can come and talk to patients about peritoneal dialysis and also can actually see them doing peritoneal dialysis. So that also gives them that, that visual experience and decrease the fear that the patient will have with doing home dialysis. Yeah. So um, Aaron, I, I, I wanted to take the chance to, to hear from you about a, an initiative in Australia that I think it's very, it, it, it was very useful just to bring the best practices into the, you know, into, into the real world. And that is, you know, this organization of uh, a nice registry uh, sort of connected with um, 
the development of clinical trials in PD and uh, how this fed back to the whole local guideline development, development and implementation scene. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about this initiative? Yeah, so I think uh, we've got a lot of thanks to some of our, our, our predecessors in Australia who were quite foresighted back in the 1970s and developed the idea of a registry, a clinical quality registry, which has been going since the mid-1970s now. And effectively, every unit in Australia puts in their data for their end-stage patients. Um, and there are a set of parameters that are collected. So for, it'll have the number of incidents and prevalent patients, the sort of stock and flow in your units, reasons for cessation and peritonitis data, uh, for example, for our PD patients. And increasingly, that as a backbone has allowed other groups, uh, for example, um, the Australian Kidney Trials Network to start to then pivot trials that have interventions that then look at those outcomes which we're collecting already and reporting. Um, and then you can start to see what impact those interventions are having. And the data comes back. So each, the head of every unit will get a summary of their unit's performance um, against each of the metrics that we are collecting compared to all of the other units across Australia. That information goes to the chief executives of the hospitals as well, so that they can see how well their unit, which they are responsible for, performs compared to the other units in their state or elsewhere. Uh, and I think that has been quite important in both driving improvements in care by looking in comparisons to other units around the place, uh, and people generally want to do well. And so they look at how they're comparing to their colleagues and where they're not doing so well, starting to ask some questions about why that might be the case. And it has been, as you said, pivotal for the, pivotal for the development of trials and, and then measuring some of those uh, outcome measures. Uh, and that's still going on to this day. Sounds great. Well, we're very close to the top of the hour. Um, 30 seconds for each one of you to provide the final message, brief message about the future of PD from your perspective. Uh, first, of you, first of all, you, Angela. Okay. I believe um, communication is very important um, among all inter interdisciplinary members even with the outs, with the communication with the hospitals as well. Um, nephrologists communicate, communicating with other nephrologists on the care of a patient. Um, I had gave example to you all earlier regarding a patient that was on PD who was discouraged to go on hemodialysis because the simple fact is that physician felt that the dialysis was not working for that patient. But if that nephrologist had communicated with his nephrologist that had been taking care of him for three years, he would have found out more information. So um, I would just say communication would be the best key for all um, members that's involved in the patient's care. Great. Matt? I'd just like to raise the point of bringing patients into the process in terms of uh, what we measure, what's important measuring best practices. And one thing we didn't touch on is just the peer-to-peer -peer education is critically important. Angela was touching on some of the issues around home dialysis, exposure of machines, but um, patients tell us over and over again, they, they wanna hear the experience from another patient. Um, and I think that's extremely important to build into a program if you can. Thanks, Matt. Aaron. Uh, I'm going to touch on exactly the same points that have been mentioned. I think uh, I think the future for PD is bright. I think we still need to work out what the optimal numbers will be. Um, I think autonomy is central around patient choice. I think having quality markers and aspiring to best practice is central to achieving that, needing local champions um, from the clinician side of things and engaging. So the SONG standardised outcome and nephrology group, uh, SONG PD, has put some nice data out already around things that are important to patients in this area, taking that on board. Uh, and I think there is a lot of scope for improvement. I think there are some interesting advances in terms of fluids, connectology, diagnostics coming. Um, it's an exciting time to be in PD. Thanks. Fred, your final words. So I think one thing we didn't cover really was PD's use in low middle income countries. I see there's gonna be a tremendous expansion of PD utilization in low middle income countries as they look to provide care for patients with end-stage kidney disease and the care is clearly cheaper and easier to set up. Um, and there are a bunch of other companies now getting into the market providing PD supplies, which hopefully will keep the cost down. I think a focus needs to be on patient-centered care. 
And we need to be sure, for example, in the U.S., that the KHI initiative makes no sense. We're not going to get up to anywhere near 80 um, percent. And the money which which we should spend should be focused on improving education for patients, setting up low clearance clinics, setting up assisted PD programs, not giving financial incentives to doctors or to dialysis programs. And I think we need to focus on quality outcomes. And I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the recent publication from the ISPD on high quality PD, which redefines the way we think about high quality perineal dialysis in a very patient-centered care focused model. Terrific, Fred. And finally, your final words, Tom. Uh, I think that uh, my colleagues have discussed specifics and I want to come down to one word and it applies to three different entities. The one word is education and the entities are doctors, nurses, and patients. I think that's the, the we, if we can improve that, we will improve the care uh, of all of this. Well, with that, um, we come to the end of our session. I think it was a fantastic discussion. I hope uh, the audience enjoyed. Um, I wanted to uh, thank each one of you, our panelists today for the great discussion. Uh, thanks um, uh, RRI for inviting me to moderate this and for the organization. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.